It's really an honor to speak here. Um, so I'll say a few words about counting nilpotent extensions. So the main driver is uh, Mahler's conjecture in this field, which is the following statement. So you let G be a finite non-trivial group. And a Mahler's conjecture asks about the count of number fields with discriminant up to X, and we have Galois group isomorphic to G. And the conjecture is that this should be asymptotic to some leading constant CG, X to some power, and then log X to some other, another power. Um, this is, of course, a generalization of the inverse Galois problem. So even showing that this set over here is not empty, showing that at least one number field with Galois group isomorphic to G is currently wide open. And therefore, this conjecture is uh, incredibly hard and incredibly difficult conjecture. Um, as I phrased this conjecture, um, this conjecture is widely believed to be correct. Um, that is a little bit of a misleading statement because originally, uh, when Mahler proposed this conjecture, he also proposed explicit values A Mahler G and B Mahler G. And this uh, special value B Mahler G that he proposed is now known to be wrong in general. We have a counter example given by Jürgen Klunos in a very nice short paper. Um, but without specifying what A, G, and B, G are, this is widely believed to be correct. And also the original A, Mahler, G is still also widely believed to be correct. Um, so even B, G currently is mysterious. Um, and C, G is in some sense even more mysterious. Um, Sometimes CG is an Euler product. Uh, we don't know exactly when and under what conditions the leading constant should be an Euler product. Uh, when is an Euler product, we expect it to be a product of local densities. And at least when uh, we look at SN extensions, the leading constant is expected to be an Euler product. This is the, the mahler bargava principle. Uh, Mahler's conjecture um, has been studied in the literature by quite a various amount of authors. Um, so let me sort of say what is currently known about this conjecture. So in the 1980s, uh, the case of abelian extensions was done by Wright. Uh, the key inputs in the proof are class field theory and the discriminant zeta function. Then there's another very classical result of Mahler's conjecture, which also predates the original conjecture which is S3 extensions by Davenport Halbron extensions and by Davenport Halbron. And I say S3 extensions, I mean uh, cubic S3 extensions, so degree three S3 extensions. And of course, this is a work that has spurred many other things with many, much follow up work, second order term, and all kinds of other results as well on Davenport Halbron. Then, of course, S4 and S5, so quartic S4 extensions and Quintic S5 extensions were done by Bhagava in two very well-known papers. So now S3 comes again, but now when I write S3, I mean Galois S3 extensions, so degree six S3 extensions were counted by Bhagava and, and Wood. Then uh, Quartic D4 extensions uh, were done by Cohen, Dias, Ideas, and Olivier. Uh, there's some follow-up work by Buco, Florea, and Serrana, Lopez, and Varma. Then there's another result uh, due to cleaners, which are generalized quaternion groups and some reef products. Uh, as a result of myself together with uh, Carla Pograno. So any nilpotent group G, such that all elements of order P are central, where P is the smallest prime dividing the cardinality of G. Uh, I should mention that this covers some of the previous results on the list. In particular, this covers abelian extensions and also covers uh, generalized quaternion groups. So, this result generalizes some of the other, other results on the list. Um, together with Etienne Fauvry, uh, I worked on non -like Heisenberg extensions. So, these are Heisenberg extensions of degree nine. Um, the main method there is uh, character sum techniques in the spirit of uh, Keith Brown and Fauvry Kluners. And then, um, well, you know, Mahler's conjecture for one group and for another product group, you can wonder if you can also prove Mahler's conjecture for direct product. And this is um, certainly not easy and you need some strong uniformity to do so. 
and direct products were done by Wang first as n times a, a abelian and as n for n and three for five. So as n for n and three for five is known, a abelian is also known, and the direct product was done by Wang with uh, the cardinality of a prime to some values, and later by mass return psi and Wang they removed this uh, condition. And I should maybe also say that uh, Brendan Albers had a lot of work on counting uh, solvable extensions. So before I continue, I want to do um, a small list of exercise uh, about counting on hyperbolas. Um, this is not going to be particularly difficult. It's going to be quite uh, useful to develop some intuition of what is going, going on. So just let's count the sum of a b squared less or equal than x. Well, this is not too difficult. If a b squared is less or equal than x, what does that mean? That means that b has to be less or equal than root x, and a can go up to x over b squared. Well, then I evaluate the sum. That's x over b squared plus o of 1. I add them all up, and I get x plus a good error. Term. All right? So this was not too difficult, but I want to make two points now about this exercise. First observation is that the main contribution of this sum comes from fixing b to be smaller than log, 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 log of x. And here I put log, 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 log of x, but I could have put any function f of x that goes to infinity as x goes to infinity. So the main contribution comes from b being extremely, extremely small. And the other observation I want to make is that if, you fi if I fix b, then every given b contributes a positive proportion to the main term, and this proportion decays extremely rapidly in b, which is the reason why we can cut off from b being as small as we like. All right, um, and now let's compare with a slightly different exercise about counting on the hyperbola. So instead of having a weight one and two on the variables, we just have the sum a, b less or equal to x now. And in this case, when we do the exercise again, then all of a sudden we get x log x plus o of x. And the point that I want to make over here is that unlike the previous example, both of the observations that I made above uh, fail now. So the main contribution does not come from fixing b small than log, 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 log x. b should grow. And similarly, every given b does not contribute a positive proportion to the main term. It contributes x, which is definitely not a positive proportion. All right, so let's keep this in mind when I'm going to sort of go to the next slide and say a few words about counting by discriminant and how this is related to counting by discriminant. All right, so let's start with a Galois extension, k of a q. And for simplicity, assume that p does not divide the, the degree. So that means that p is tamely ramified in extension. And then it's not very hard to directly write down a formula for the periodic valuation of the discriminant. This formula is just the degree of the extension times one minus one over the size of an inertia subgroup. So we see that the periodic valuation discriminant depends on the size of the inertia subgroup. And if we want to make the Periodic valuation discriminant as small as possible, we want to make the inertia subgroup as small as possible. And for this reason, counting by discriminant has some very strong similarities with counting in the hyperbola in the sense that um, if you count with discriminant up to x, you get a formula, namely product of ramified primes, and every prime has some exponent on it, and that exponent and the product has to be less or equal than x. And because we are counting under the hyperbola like this, that means that heuristically, what you want to do you want to send almost all ramified primes in a typical field K of a Q, is that the inertia group are as small as possible, because if you make the inertia groups small, the exponent and the discriminant is going to be as small as possible. And that's one how you get the most stuff, right? Just in the previous slide, as we saw in counting on the hyperbola, you wanted to make uh, the A B squared, you want to make B very small and A big. And also here, we're counting with some, uh, valu some valuations on our discriminant, and we want to make the exponents as small as possible to get lots of extensions. So morally, what happens when you count by discriminant is that you want your inertia subgroups to be as small as possible. So typically, your inertia subgroup is going to be very small. And this uh, very much influences things when you're counting by discriminant. So let's do uh, maybe a small example. So this phenomena that uh, the primes have different weight depending on uh, where the, how much they ramify is um, 
something that has been both exploited by some authors and is also something that causes a great amount of difficulties. So I want to now do two examples, one where you can really exploit the way the discriminant works to make your counting a lot easier. And next, I'm going to give you an example where the discriminant actually makes counting a lot harder. So let's do a small example. So we count non-Galois quartic D4 extensions. So if L over Q is a quartic D4 extension with its unique relic subfield P and K, then if P is least not two, then you can write down an easy formula for the periodic valuation discriminant, which depends on the ramification type of your prime P in the field. If P is totally ramified, then the exponent is three in the discriminant. Uh, in all other cases, then the exponent is two. It's one if P is unramified in K over Q and ramifies in the big in the biquadratic. And what do I mean by biquadratic? Well, L is quartic D4, so its Galois closure would be an actual D4 extension, and that contains a biquadratic field. So that's what I mean by the biquadratic field. And of course, the exponent is zero of P is unramified. All right, so when you start counting D4 extensions, the discriminant has to shape A, B squared, C cubed. And Every time you ramify in the quadratic field, it's going to be either B squared or C cubed. So primes that ramify in the quadratic subfield K, they come with a higher exponent, namely an exponent two or exponent three. So what does that mean? If we go back to this hyperbola exercise, it means that the, that the main contribution when you count non-Galois quadratic D4 extensions, the main contribution comes from quadratic fields K, with discriminant being smaller than lock, 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 x. And again, I put lock, 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 but I could have put any function going to infinity as x goes to infinity. And similarly, uh, also like the Iberola exercise, a positive proportion of the quartic D4 extensions have a given quadratic field k as a subfield. So there are two kinds of weird things going on here when you count quartic D4 extensions. The main contribution comes from fixing the quadratic subfield and then twisting it. But this also actually helps you. It helps you count quartic D4 extensions because you fix a quadratic field and then you uniformly count uh, quadratic fields of that field. All right. Um, so this is a case where we were able to exploit uh, counting extensions, but there are also cases where it becomes much more difficult to count extensions when you're counting by discriminant. So I want to give you an example where group theoretic properties actually make your life really difficult to count extensions. So let me give you, so quartic D4 is an example that works quite easily, but if you take uh, now Galois extensions with Galois group isomorphic to the dihedral group of size to the n, this is a very difficult case to count by discriminant. So let's see why this is a difficult case when we're counting by discriminant. So remember the dihedral group is z mod to the n z semi-direct z mod 2z, and the elements of minimal order in our dihedral group are either of the shape k, one, with k being anything, these are just the usual reflections in the dihedral group, and the other elements of order two are two to the n minus one times k, so that these are rotations of order divided in two. So this is either the identity element or the unique rotation of order two. So that means that we want to send our inertia elements essentially always either to reflections or to this rotation of order dividing two. So now when we look at the field diagram of a dihedral field, so how does this roughly look? The dihedral field starts with a biquadratic field, and then there's one special called biquadratic field on which on top you have a cyclic extension of degree two to the n. You have q, q with a, q with a, b. Here you have the fixed field of the rotation, and then you have a cyclic extension of degree two to the n. And what happens is that in the cyclic extension of degree to the n, if you go from this field to this field, these are all elements where we have order bigger than two. So that means that inertia should be very, very small in extension L to the 2n minus one, comma zero with this fixed field to Q with AB. So that means that the positive proportion of extensions basically should have this field over this field and ramified when you're counting by discriminant, the hero extensions. But this basically means that if you want to count the hero extension by discriminant, it's at least as hard as getting the distribution of the two infinity torsion of the class group. And this is, of course, a notoriously difficult problem. Um, this particular one, of course, uh, has been recently solved by Alex Smith. And it's likely that if you adapt this work and work very hard, you could probably also count the hero extension with Galois group P to the, to the end. 
but at least it gives you some indication of why accounting by discriminants for the heat wave tensions might be very difficult as in the sense that at least as hard as a problem that until recently was unsolved and very difficult on its own. All right. Um, so we see that the sort of discriminant counting is a mixed pack. Sometimes it becomes a little bit easier. Sometimes it can be very difficult. And there's also some kind of unfairness when we are counting by discriminant. So let me say a few words about what is called uh, fair counting functions. So as we've already seen, when we're counting by discriminant, there are some undesirable features. Um, the leading constant when we're counting by discriminant need not be an Euler product. And usually in like number theory, we find it really nice and we really like it when our leading constants are an Euler product. And very much related to this, uh, subfields may occur a positive proportion of the time. That's sort of something we've already seen for counting quartic D4 extensions. And these sort of issues, um, they came up and Melanie Wood was the first one to sort of address them. And she said in 2010, that's uh, the better ways to count number of fields. And she introduced a class of so-called fair counting functions that sort of should avoid some of these problems that discriminant has. So let me give you some important examples of fair counting functions. So one example of a fair counting function will be the conductor of an abelian extension. And another example of a fair counting function that actually generalizes also to non-abelian extensions is the product of random five primes. Um, so these counting functions have also been studied in the literature. So one very well-known rule uh, result is by, by Maki from 1993, who proved Mahler's conjecture when we order abelian extensions not by discriminant, Instead, if we order at the in extensions by conductor. And I would myself see prove Mahler's conjecture for any fair counting function, which is a fairly general class of counting functions. And uh, she proved it for uh, also for arbitrary local conditions. So this is a very flexible and useful result. And finally, as one more result that I should sort of mention is category of fair counting functions, which is to Due to Altu, Shankar, Valma, and Wilson in 2017, which is Mahler's conjecture for quartic D4 extension, instead of ordering them by discriminant, they ordered them by, by art and conjecture, by art and conductor. And all of the examples, uh, leading constant turned out to be an Euler product, sort of affirming the sort of the fact that counting with fair counter function is sort of more intrinsic and nicer than counting by discriminant in that sense. All right, so let me say a few words about the main result I want to talk about today. So I call a group G nilpotent if it's a direct product of P groups. So in a P group, it's just any group of cardinality, a power of P. And then the theorem that I want to mention, which is joint work with Carla Pagano, is the following. So we'll assume GRH. Um, I've been trying to get rid of this assumption, but I haven't succeeded yet. And let G be an opotent group with the canality of G uh, being odd. Then what is the result? Um, so instead of being able to count extensions, we give a lower bound. So we show the lim inf, we count extensions k over q, we order by the product of ramified primes, we impose that the Galois group is as small as to G, and then we divide by this expression over here, and we show it's bigger or equal than one. And what is the thing in the bottom? The bottom is the expected Euler product and the naive analog of Mahler's constant. So maybe uh, to put it sort of as simply as possible in words, we get uh, the lower bound completely on the nose, completely sharp that you might naively expect. All right. Um, and why do I write the naive analog of Mahler's constant in this situation? So you might hope that uh, the asymptotic, so as I said, at the, at the start of the talk, uh, Mahler's conjecture has counterexamples, but you might hope that in the setting of nilpotent groups and counting with this sort of nicer counting function for the ramified primes, all these counterexamples would go away. And the surprising part that I sort of want to, to add to this theorem is that this unfortunately is not true. And there are still very similar kind of uh, counterexamples that can happen also when you count by product ramified primes where you can have much more extensions than you might naively expect. 
if you write the naive analog of Mahler's constant, then the corresponding asymptotic that you might hope to be true is unfortunately not true. And I have some counterexamples uh, in my potency class too that I'll not have time to discuss today. If you want to have know more about it, then I'd be more than happy to, to let you know and, and to talk about it. All right, so to summarize, the main theorem is we get a lower bound for counting by port of ramp by prime. That's completely uh, sharp. And of course, you might wonder, then what about the upper bound? Um, for some groups and in some scenarios, I've been able to also prove the corresponding upper bound, upgrading this to an asymptotic. Um, and we're trying to figure out if we can make it into an asymptotic in completely generality. Um, that we have not succeeded at, but we would be very interested in making this into an asymptotic in complete generality, of course. Um, but for some, some, for some conditions on G, it works. But in general, we definitely have not succeeded yet. All right, um, so let me say a few words about some applications, which um, are sort of follow very much the spirit of the proof. So I take a triple of groups, all P groups of P odd, subjecting G2 and G3, subjecting on G1. Then the following are equivalent. So for every diagram like this, so what does this diagram say? Every G1 extension of Q that lifts to a G2 extension also lifts to a G3 extension. All right, so this diagram says that every G1 extension of Q that lifts to a G2 extension also lifts to a G3 extension. And then what's the other equivalence? Well, we can do this diagram also locally everywhere. So for every place V and every diagram, we do the same thing. So let's send TQV to G1. For any G1 algebra that lifts to a G2 algebra locally, should also lift to a G3 algebra locally. Okay, so these two statements are equivalent. So this is some kind of local to global extensions, local to global principle, but uh, I don't assume anything about the extension being central, which is uh, the typical sort of local to global principles that you may have seen. All right. Um, and let me say a few more words about this local to global principle. So, this last diagram with the local field saying that any G1 algebra that lifts to a G2 algebra also lifts to a G3 algebra, you can uh, completely rephrase this group theoretically because we understand the maximal for P extensions with P co prime to V of GQV very well. And this is equivalent to some group theory condition that I'll just write down. And it's not very important exactly what it is. But the point that I want to make about this is that this is a completely group theoretic condition on the pair G1, G2, D3. Um, so any triple G1, G2, D3 that satisfies this locally everywhere is essentially just a group theoretic condition. And that means that this writes down any triple G1, G2, D3 that has this group theoretic property gives you a non-trivial invariant of the absolute Galois group of GQ. All right, so then you might wonder is there such an example of a non-trivial triple G1, G2, D3? And the answer to that is yes, there are some interesting triples G1, G2, D3. Um, so FP to the N, which I view as, as I have the upper triangle matrices, N plus one by N plus one. The main diagonal is once, and the diagonal above, you can consider the abelianization, which is the FP to the N, and take the upper triangular matrices modulo the center, and I take the upper triangular matrices this is a triple that does this. So any upper triangular matrix, so if I take any FPN extension that lifts to an upper triangular matrix extension modular center, it actually lifts to an upper triangular matrix extension. And this is very uh, surprising and, and, and non-obvious. And in fact, this is known as the massive vanishing conjecture. Um, and this was recently proven by Harper Swittenberg for all P and all number fields. Um, and this special case uh, reproves this triple G1, G2, G3, reproves um, their conjecture, at least for, for Q and for primes P not equal to two. And we are hoping to be able to push our methods to reprove the massive vanishing conjecture for all P and all number fields, but this requires a little bit more effort. All right. Um, so one condition in our main theorem that I also want to elaborate on before I give sort of a proof sketch is that uh, we assumed in our main theorem that the canality of G is odd. And 
this assumption in some sense uh, is fairly natural and it also corresponds to a substantial difference in our understanding of the inverse Galois problem. So of course, there's a many connection between Malus conjecture and the inverse Galois problem, right? If you want to prove Malus conjecture, at least you have to show that there exists one extension, because at least you have to also get your handle on the inverse Galois problem in some sense. And this understanding is rather, this difference is rather substantial in the sense that if the quality of G is odd and G is not potent, then the inverse Galois problem was solved by Schultz and Reichardt. And this proof is just three, four pages using local to global and some sort of smart tricks um, in the 1930s. So this is sort of fairly old and, and this is a paper that you can read easily in a day without too much trouble. And then instead for two groups, if you want to do the AF inverse Galois problem, it is much, much more difficult. Um, and the only proof I know is essentially to appeal to a famous result of Zeferevich, who says that inverse Galois problem is solved for solvable groups, which means that, of course, in particular, it's solved for two groups. But I don't know any proof that's potentially simpler than appealing to Zeferevich's work, which is uh, a very complicated and, and hard and difficult proof. So I'll not say anything about Zeferevich's proof of uh, inverse Galois problem for two groups, but uh, in the time that I have, uh, I want to give a few words about how Schultz and Weichart solve the inverse Galois problem for groups that are odd and, and nilpotent. Um, and I want to give sort of a sketch of this proof. In some sense, our, our result um, is very much inspired, I think, by this sort of schultz Weichart argument. So I first want to say a few words about schultz Weichart, and then I'll sort of try to explain how the schultz Weichart ideas come back when we try to solve uh, when, we, when we want to prove our main theorem. All right. So how would you prove uh, schultz weichardt theorem? So let me remind you, this is showing that uh, every nilpotent group of odd cardinality uh, can be realized as a Galois group over Q. All right. So one thing that's really nice about nilpotent group and nilpotent groups is that um, they can be built up from repeated central extensions. And repeated sense of extensions are understood quite well in the sense that we have a local to global principle for them. So we're going to try to argue inductively um, to prove this. So I'm going to start with H B and P group and I'll let G be a central FP extension of H. So that means that I have an exact sequence like this. One goes to FP, goes to G, goes to H, goes to one. All right, and FP lands in the center of G. And then what we want to achieve is that suppose we already have an H extension pi from GQ to H. So I have a homomorphism from GQ to H, continuous homomorphism. Then what you want to do, of course, is that what we want to achieve is we want to make a homomorphism from GQ to G. So we want to lift a homomorphism that we have to a homomorphism to G. And of course, this may or may not be possible. Sometimes you can lift it, sometimes you can't. Um, and this sort of problem, whether you can or cannot lift to it, is well understood. These are known as central embedding problems, and there's a local to global principle for such central embedding problems. All right, so it's well known that we have a local to global principle for the above diagram. So you can lift um, this H extension if and only you can lift it locally everywhere. And that essentially means, roughly speaking, that what we have to do is we have to control the images of Frobenius uh, on the pi. So we want to make sure that the Frobenius elements at the ramified primes in our ACE extension are at the right places, because that means that we can lift it locally, and then we can lift it local, globally, but local to global. And now, of course, it may happen that we are unfortunate, and our Frobenius elements in our ACE extension are just in the wrong places. So what do we do if the Frobenius elements are not in the right places in H? Okay, so the idea is the following. H also itself fits in an exact sequence. So again, H is still more potent. So H is also a central extension of another extension, H prime extension. And that means that uh, when you look at this, if you have a given H extension, you can always twist it by a degree P, a cyclic degree P character with a new H extension. So you can twist your extension to get uh, new extensions. And then the idea is that we're going to use our twists 
to essentially fix all the Rubini's elements in our extension. All right, so if we take chi L to be of prime conductor L and ramify it in pi, then we want to twist with chi L in such a way that we fix all the Frobenius elements in H. And then by local to global, we can lift to our desired extension G. Okay. Um, so this is not so hard by Shebo Tariff. I can just sort of move my Frobenius around in the way that I like, and I can put them in the right place. But there's one sort of caveat, and here's sort of the, the point where L alt comes in. If I add chi L, then the resulting map also ramifies at L. And that means that we also should check the local to global principle at this other new ramified prime and see if we still can make the local to global work. So we also need to check local to global now at this new prime L. And um, so that means that also the Fabian at L needs to be in the right place. And at this point, and now in a very sneaky way, we're going to use that P is odd in a crucial way. And that's the following observation is that if I take the Frobenius element in the quadratic character of conductor L, and I take the Frobenius element of L in the quadratic character of conductor Q, if P is odd, then these symbols are essentially independent. So they equidistribute, so you can make chi L for Q and chi Q for L, and essentially whatever you want. But this is definitely not true for P equals to two, because then this is the Legendre symbol Q on L versus the Legendre symbol L on Q. And of course, these are related by quadratic reciprocity. Well, cubic reciprocity, in fact, doesn't say anything about these symbols. Quadratic reciprocity, because roots of unity are already present in Q, they do say something. And yet, that chi alpha Q and chi Q for L are related if P were to be two. But luckily, P is odd. So chi alpha Q and chi Q for L are related. So not only can I use L to fix all the old for beings elements, I can meanwhile also ensure that the Rubin's element of L itself is in the place that I want it to be. And then uh, the argument works and we can inductively try to build our extension up and we get our G extension in this way. All right, um, so this is sort of the idea behind the proof. Um, but let me now sort of, sort of try to explain the proof in a sort of more, um, Exactly how we so the sort of this was the inspiration for the proof, uh, but now let me sort of go into the nitty gritty details of the of the actual proof itself. So the proof itself has sort of uh, roughly three steps, and the first step is just to sort of penetrate our extensions. So Neponian extensions are sort of nice in the sense that they admit a parameterization that is pretty decent. So generalizing the fact that we can parameterize quadratic extensions quite well. You can also parameterize Neponian extension in still a relatively decent way. So to give some kind of idea how the techniques work, I'm going to sort of switch setting and I'm going to try to unconditionally give an overview of the proof of the asymptotic for the number of Galois D4 extensions by polar development by primes. All right, so before we do that, let's try to parameterize Galois D4 extensions in a sensible way. All right, so again, we have a central exact sequence. So a D4 extension has a, contains a bi-quadratic extension for that, and it's central over that. So we have F2 goes to D4 goes to F2 squared. And if you want to parameterize bi-quadratic extension, that's not so bad. AP morphisms from GQ to F2 squared, which is uh, essentially bi-quadratic extensions, are just pairs of uh, square free integers with A and B linearly independent in Q star much like Q star squared. All right, so a uh, bicyclic extension, we think of it as a pair of square free integers. And then we want to know when this is a bicyclic extension actually lifts to a D4 extension. So when is my field Q root A would be contained in a D4 extension? Well, so what do we want to know? We have an AP morphism from GQ to F2 squared, which we think of as a bicyclic extension Q root A would be. And we want to wonder when does it lift to a D4 extension? And of course, again, we are back to the central embedding problems. So again, we have the same sort of diagram now made completely concrete. When can I lift an F2 squared extension to a D4 extension? And this central embedding problem, um, because this is so concrete, this embedding, central embedding problem is very, has a very concrete answer. An F2 squared extension, so Q would A would be if Q is contained in a D4 extension if and only if the equation x squared is ay squared plus bc squared as a non-trivial q point. 
And not with this consistent, of course, having a non-trivial Q point for a conic also has a local to global. So this is consistent with the thing I told you before. Central embedding problems have a local to global. And points having a Q point on a conic also has a local to global. So at least this is consistent. And this is a fairly nice uh, and well understood local to global principle. All right. Um, then there's sort of one more uh, thing that we have to take account. And that's the fact that we can twist. So I told you we can answer when does our bicyclic field lift to a D4 extension. We have a good answer to that. And as soon as you can lift your extension to a D4 extension, you don't have just one D4 extension. All of a sudden you have a ton of D4 extensions. So what happens if I have an apomorphism from GQ to uh, D4? So that's just a D4 extension lifting my extension pi then you can make a ton more D4 extensions by just lift twisting my D4 extension by a quadratic character. So if I think of my D4 extension as Q with A would be with alpha, you can just replace with alpha by with alpha times some rational. And this gives me a new D4 extension. So in this way, I can make a ton more D4 extensions. So say this a little bit more explicitly, what does it mean? We have a bijection between the volumes and sets. We have a set a morses from GQ to D4 and triples of A, B, C, all square free integers. A, B has to be independent. X squared is A, Y squared with B, C squared is soluble. So that means that our extension lifts, our bicyclic extension quite Q with A would be lifts to a D4 extension. And this extra parameter C, of which we have no conditions, that's consistent because the extra parameter C is our twist parameter can always twist a D4 extension by just changing root alpha to root alpha C. So that's the extra parameter C in, in our projection. All right, uh, and then of course, if this is our projection, we want to be able to read off what is the product of element five primes under our projection. And if we ignore all issues at two, two is of course always more complicated because two is wildly ramified, then the product of ramified primes in an RD4 extension, it's just a product of ABC, but ABC need not be co prime. So then we need to take the radical of the product of ABC. And here there is something that's sort of slightly annoying. Uh, counting by product of the radical smaller than something, it's not particularly convenient analytically. Um, it's a little bit annoying to count by radical ABC small equal X. That's sort of a well known trick. Uh, that sort of makes your life a little bit easier when you're counting by the radical of a product smaller than X. And that's the following. So instead of working with three variables, it's more convenient to work with uh, seven variables. Um, and these, var these variables are make as follows. I de declare the variable alpha s. Well, alpha s is a product of all points p dividing variables in s and not dividing the variables in the complement. Um, so in this way, I make uh, seven variables, keeping track of exactly how much you divide each of A, B, and C. So in this way, I go from three to seven variables. And these variables are all co-prime by construction. Um, they're also still square free. So now I'm counting by seven uh, co-prime square free parameters of uh, variables. Um, and the radical of the pro product of A, B, C now has just become the product over all the variables. All right, so this is convenient. Um, and it's not too difficult to get back to the old variables, A, B, C, if you want to, which we'll have to do because the conditions that X squared is A, Y squared is a B, Z squared is soluble. So we wanna get back to our A, B, C variables at some point. So how do we do this? If you take T, A to be the subset of A, B, C containing A, then how do I get back A? You take the product of all the variables alpha, S, where S has to contain uh, where S is any subset in, in the set of subsets containing A. So S has to contain A. And similarly for B and C. All right. So when we count the four extensions, what does it come down to? Ignoring some mild issues at two, we have to evaluate the following infinite sum or finite sum, I should say. The product of seven co prime square free variables is smaller equal to X. Uh, they are all pairwise co-prime and square free. This is the Möbius function. 
And A, as I said, A is a product of alpha A, alpha AB, alpha AC, alpha ABC. B is a product similarly. So to, to get a D4 extension, you just count when X squared is A, Y squared plus B, Z squared is soluble over Q. So you get the indicator of X squared is A, Y squared plus B, Z squared is soluble. All right. So now we have to figure out how to detect when X squared is A, Y squared plus B, Z squared is soluble, or well, this sort of more horrible thing with uh, A being the product of four alpha variables and B being the four, product of four variables as well. And now we use Hassan and Skosky and detect the solubility of chronic locally at prime speed dividing alpha S uh, using a Lysander symbol. So maybe to give an example, if P divides alpha A, then if you want to solve this conic over QP, then it's well known that it's equivalent to just solving it over, over FP. And then what you have to do, you have to just check that uh, P is a square modulo, that alpha B, alpha AB, alpha BC, alpha ABC is a square modulo P. And this you can just detect using quadratic characters. And when we do this, we can rewrite our sum as a sum over the genre symbols involving the variables alpha S. All right, so then we rewrite our sum over seven square feet co-prime variables with a ton of Legendre symbols. And then we have to find the main term of this character sum. And this is very much in the spirit of sort of Heath Brown and, and Fulvi Kluner's uh, kind of arguments, if you have seen that. Um, so there's sort of two main tools that you have to evaluate the resulting character sums. Uh, you have the Shibotar density theorem and, and the large SIF, and you have to sort of combine them judiciously you get the desired oscillation in your character sums, and then you're left over the main term, and that gives you sort of a counting function of the four extensions at the end of the day. Um, so let me say maybe a few words um, how to generalize this process to sort of prove sort of the main theorem that I had at the very beginning uh, in the slides. All right, so how would you generalize this process? Well, again, the first step in the proof is you can build an opponent extension by iterated central extensions. And if you do this, uh, this yields the fermentation of G extensions by triples of square feet integers, uh, where we sort of abstract away from now from that central embedding problem. So as you sort of go up and up in the tower in the uh, central extensions, they become more and more difficult and local to global principle also becomes more difficult. But at least no matter what, it comes down to, to controlling your Frobenius elements in your previous extension. So you can parentalize by square free integers and then you can attach an extension to that. And then to see if it lifts, you have to find out how the Fabian elements behave in your extension. So as I said, the central abandoning problems get much and much, much, much more harder, but at least you still satisfy local to global. And that means that if I know the Fabian elements in my previous extension, I can tell whether it lifts to the next extension. All right, so we want to find uh, the Fabian's elements exactly at the at the ramified prime. So usually you want to find Fabian's elements at the unramified primes, but we, in this case, you're really interested at Fabian's elements at the ramified primes for this problem. And um, at this point, it is where we, so I haven't really explained yet why we make use of the ordering. Why do we do this by product ramified primes, and not by discriminant ordering, for example? Um, and I, I'm also going to explain now how this connects to the schultz weichardt proof. So in our chosen ordering, it uh, was very important. Um, so when you make a central extension, you can always make a minimally ramified uh, central extension where you sort of make the ramification locus as small as possible. And when you order by product ramified primes, is that when you take this minimally ramified extension, then a typical extension still has to twist from them a while a large twist, because otherwise, you not be sending your inertia element to this place. Well, if you order by further ramified primes, inertia subgroups should just go everywhere equally often. So that means that a typical extension should be a rather large twist of the minimally ramified central extension. And the point now is that um, knowing what Frobenius elements are in the minimally ramified extremes as central extension is really difficult, right? I said at the start, if you want to count Galois, the helo extensions, then uh, you. you by discriminant, if you want to count the heel extensions of size to be n by discriminant, you need to essentially count ramified extensions. And this is extremely difficult. And this generalizes also this something. 
connect the distribution of Fabian's elements in minimally ramified extensions is extremely difficult. However, as I just pointed out, when you come up with the ramified primes, every time that you make a central extension, you got to make a rather large twist. And this rather large twist we can exploit. So despite the fact that when we make a central extension, just like in the schultz weichert proof, you have no idea where your new Fabian's elements land in the central after the first central extension. Also for us, in our setting, we have no idea where the Fabian's elements are after we make our first central extension. However, it doesn't matter because then we get to make a very large twist. And using this very large twist, we do know in this twist, because it's just a twist by a cyclic character, where we're very well understood where the Fabian's elements are. And in this twist, we control what the Fabian's elements are. So in the end, we manage to control what the Fabian's elements are in the whole extension. And this sort of is very similar to the schultz weichert mechanism, where also every time you make central extension, you don't know what happens to Fabinius, but you make a twist so that you, know, you do know what happens to Fabinius. And this trick sort of generalizes in a sort of a quantitative way. And that's how you get um, the main theorem by essentially really exploiting the fact that every time that you make a central extension, you still get a twist afterwards. And there you can control what happens to Fabinius, meaning you get to control Fabinius in the entire extension after all. Um, and then one more thing I want to say sort of to end the talk is that um, one of the conditions in the theorem is uh, that we assume GRH um, and the proof can most likely be made unconditional if somebody were to have a suitably strong latch shift for the point extensions. But as far as I know, um, if you want to have a large shift for Nippon extensions, I have not been able to find or see any large shift for Nippon extensions in, in the literature so far. And it definitely doesn't seem entirely obvious how to do this. But if you were able to do such a thing, I'm rather confident that you would be able to make a proof uh, unconditional and we don't, you don't need uh, GRH. All right, thank you so much. <laughs>